Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's talk on preparing to launch your team, effective college planning tips and strategies. Today we've got lots to cover. So without any further delay, we are going to move right into it. We're gonna go over the cost of college and calculating what's known as the COA, the cost of attendance. We're gonna talk about how to motivate your team, how to build their confidence. We're gonna talk about how to save 33% on the cost of a college degree. We're going to talk about financial aid a little bit, qualifying, applying, different types. Um, certainly gonna talk about scholarships and merit aid and defining your target schools, which I have found over the years to be the key to being successful in this whole endeavor. I'm also gonna talk a little bit about lowering your stress and having college success, because this is a lot to tackle as a parent. There's an awful lot of moving parts and things are changing constantly, and there's just a lot of different aspects. So hopefully you will pick up a lot of tips as we go through this in every area that I've mentioned, as well as just generally just how to relax a little bit through the process. So let me introduce myself. I'm Catherine O'Brien. I um, am the founder of Celtic College Consultants. I've been doing college planning and working with students across the country since 2004. Um, I love being a student advocate and helping them become the best people that they can be to go do whatever it is they're here to do. Um, I've written a number of books at this point, The Ultimate Guide to Top Quality College Planning, which I wrote for parents looking for college consultants to have some idea of all the different certifications and what to look for and the wide spectrum of um, services that are offered. And then I've also written two college guides um, specifically for Catholics because there's a whole set of special needs that they have in addition to everything else that we all look for. Um, and all of those are available on Amazon. I've spoken at lots of conferences to parents as well as to other college planning professionals and admissions officers. Um, I'm a certified college planning specialist. I've had that certification for almost 10 years at this point. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering from Northwestern. So I understand what it is to go to a top school. I understand what it is to be a woman in engineering. And I also have a master's degree in theology from Franciscan University of Steubenville. So I understand the liberal arts as well and I can write and articulate myself. And I recognize that every person has an intrinsic value and I really try to help them, each student I work with, come to that full awareness in themselves of their gifts, talents, and abilities. So let's look at the total cost to attend. It's not just tuition, but it's also books and room and board and insurance and fees and expenses. And all of this gets put together into what's called the cost of attendance. And that's for every year. So um, I share this at the beginning just so that it helps diffuse some of the in, in lingo that goes on in this whole college world. Um, and a lot of times parents will say, oh, well, it's like $72,000 there. That's for four years, right? Saying, no, that's per year. Um, so you will see a huge range. Um, and you'll see schools that say, oh, our tuition's only six grand. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and how much are your fees, and how much of this, and how much of that. So um, the cost of attendance figures, what you're really looking for, and every school has an official one. Um, and it may vary in a university. Uh, for example, your arts and your engineering science students have additional fees um, a lot of times. So the official cost of attendance for those colleges might be a little bit different than the College of Speech, say, at that school. So, But there is an official one, and that's what you're going to find published. Okay, but then we also need to look at the broader picture of what's the cost of a bachelor's degree, because understanding how much it costs to go for a year is one thing, but obviously you don't get a degree in a year. So um, the public universities average 124,620 over six years, which is the average time it is to graduate. Um, and then you also lose two years of wages because it's a four year degree. So the total, kind of opportunity cost of getting a bachelor's degree at a public university averages 100, almost 172,000. Now, private universities, they average graduating in four years, um, but they cost a little bit more. So the average cost there is 187,800. Those are the raw numbers. And then I also um, was able to research what the average net costs are, because I don't know if you're aware of this, but most people do not pay sticker price. 
So you'll see that you know price at seventy-two thousand or fifty-five thousand or thirty-four or whatever it is, and you're thinking that's what you're going to have to pay. But in actuality, you're going to pay something different, and your neighbor's going to pay something different, and your kids' roommates are paying something different because of need-based aid and scholarships and all kinds of things that go into it. So we do know average net cost figures. They are published to the Department of Education. And so when we look at the public universities, when we're looking at net cost, which is the out-of-pocket mom and dad families are paying, um, it's 89640 um, over six years. And then you have that lost wages figure. So then the total cost of a bachelor's degree at a public university averages almost 137000 At the private universities, um, it's hundred and almost 107000 So the out-of-pocket, although it's more per year, is less per degree. So sometimes it's a cash flow issue. But I'd like to share kind of what we're actually looking at. Okay, so let's see what we can do to improve the situation. Sorry, I forgot all these little things were there. So how do we manage it? These are things that people often think of and, and they're not necessarily the best ideas, but I bring them up so that we can discuss them and settle for a less desirable school. When you, that less desirable school may or may not have the major, may not have a graduation rate, there's a lot of things to look at. So sometimes paying less this year means paying more overall and spending a lot more time. Sometimes it means they won't graduate at all. So you kind of need to really look at the bigger picture. Um, and and I do have some uh, tips I'll be sharing about how to lower costs, just period, um, which can help. Um, send one child at a time. Actually, um, need-based financial aid uh, divides the parent contribution by the number of students. So that doesn't necessarily make sense, not send them at all. I think even with the cost of college being what it is, the opportunities that are available for the students who are, who are college ready, you know, some of our kids have different skills and college isn't the right path for them, for the, but for the college ready, there's a huge opportunity cost that's lost because they don't have the degree. So a lot of people won't even talk to them as far as jobs and interviewing. Um, and then do we send to a community college and then transfer? Um, in the interest of time, I could cut out all my, all my slides on this, but the data is that of the degree-seeking community college students, fewer than 25% of them have a degree, a bachelor's degree within six years. Um, so we're not seeing the idea work out that we all have in our heads. And uh, some of us knew or did at, when we were younger, where people went to the community college for two years and they transferred to the university and they finished in two years and they were done in four. That's just not what's happening um, in most places. So it is different in different areas of the country, but sadly the numbers are not bearing it out that that is a successful two and two plan for most students. So I certainly encourage you to do the research if that's something you're looking at doing. And then other other options, of course, that's why we're here. Before we get two into all of those, I wanted to take a minute at the beginning here to talk about our kids because we can figure out the financial side of it. We can figure out great schools that our family is really comfortable with, but if our student isn't motivated and they're not feeling it, <laughs> we're cooperating with us, then it's not really gonna benefit us. So this is where they start, just kind of lost. The picture of Chicago is because that's where I'm from. But what's their focus? What do I do with myself? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? And answering this question I have found over the years makes all the difference in the world as far as the engagement of the student. So it's just where we, I spend a lot of time. First, we start with dreams. And, and forgive me, um, my staff just left all the the funny little fade-ins in there, and it, those should have been removed. So I hope they're not too distracting. But we've got to start with, what are, what are your dreams? What do you want to be? And and some of us grew up, you know, since we were four, saying, I want to be a doctor, or I want to be an astronaut, or I want to play in a rock band, or whatever. But a lot of kids are, I don't know. And they'll say, well, I want to do whatever mom or dad does, because it's familiar, at least. Or maybe another relative. But they don't really know what they want to do. Um, so. It's helpful. I use a, a computer program actually to help 
bridge that gap, that initial gap of I'm good at these things and I like those things, but I have no idea what I would do. Um, and it has some surveys and looks at the personalities and different interests and things. It comes up with starter lists of potential careers and the kids can search and we have this dialogue that goes on after it to get them started. So first we need to get them spinning some dreams. What could I be doing? What kind of person could I be? What What is the most important to me? Some people it's family, some people it's their faith, some people it's the environment or finding new things or making new things or, you know, so it's, we've got this huge mix. And so finding something that resonates in some way. Um, and then you can't just be done with, okay, I'm going to just got my dream. We got to do some homework. So we've got to explore, like I'm working with a, a pair of twins right now and they're delightful young men and they're sophomores. And so we started this and they, their surveys are both coming out. Oh, we want to do engineering. Oh, we're looking at this. We want to be mechanical engineering. And then I'm getting grades and I'm getting preliminary test scores. And the one young man's just not very good at math. And if you know anything about engineering, it requires an enormous amount of math. And so he's starting to falter before he's even hitting algebra two. And I'm aware that Oh, yeah, after algebra two comes pre-calculus and calc one, two, three, differential equations, linear algebra, this, that, the other thing, all these math classes before you even get into your engineering curriculum. And so that kind of reality check place, but it has to come in. So the exploration, he started like, oh, this looks like interesting work. And then the reality check conversation in, in this particular dialogue will be our next conversation. We we'll say, okay, if that's really what you want to do, your math isn't where it needs to be. So help me understand because he's a new client. So I don't know him that well yet. You know, what's going on there? Is it lack of motivation there? Lack of skill? Do you need a tutor? Do you have a disconnect with your teacher? Or is, do we need to refine what we want to do and go back to the exploration phase? So this is an iterative process, but they can't do it by themselves. You know, he's thinking, Oh, I could go be an engineer, but it's not realistic, at least not where he's at right now. Um, so we got to check their skills and their personality and the future prospects. I always go into this with um, the kids and they don't know how to do this, but I go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and other places where we've got data. The government gets an enormous amount of information about all of us and they aggregate the data and they put it out there. And so I can see based on projections of populations and incomes and things that, you know, yes, we're expecting to have a growth in this field and the the average starting salary is this and the median salary is that, or, you know, this is a great field, but it's really shrinking. And so the prospects aren't very good. Let's have a backup plan or let's maybe evaluate your second choice and kind of see what makes the most sense in here. So helping them have that kind of realistic cross check. So they're not getting their hopes and dreams pinned on. I want to go do this fabulous thing that, they don't have a chance of ever being able to do realistically in our in our society. So then from there, we create goals. What majors, what schools, what do I wanna do now? And all of a sudden, this whole process, I think you can see how it motivates the student because they're recognizing this darned math class or English essay or whatever it is they have to struggle with today actually is on this path toward this thing that I really am interested in doing. And I know something about it and I've explored it. And this is something I could make some decent money or do whatever, achieve my goals, help save the world in, you know, building uh, more bio-friendly fuels or cleaning up the oceans or whatever it is that they are internally motivated by already. And now that assignment is more than just that assignment and, and that, I've seen such an enormous shift year after year, student after student with now they're motivated. And now it makes sense because they've got a context. It's not just one more assignment. Um, I actually have a, a junior I'm working with who's had a lot of struggles during his high school years. And he was sharing it. He's like, it just looks like an endless list of assignments. And I'm so dismayed because I wanted, I finished this assignment and all they're going to tell me is what the next one is and the next one and the next one. And I don't see a path out. And we had just started talking. So it's like, let's look at some career stuff so you can see. And he had come with some ideas. And like, if you want to do that initial idea, you need to get through this and that so you can have the training you need to go do that, that work and help those young people. He, he found that he was helping depressed 
teams. And it, it was amazing his ability to kind of get in there and do that as a team. Um, and he's like, oh, okay. So suddenly now the assignments are getting done and he's not the happiest caper yet because some of his assignments are not what he likes, but he gets why he needs to do it and why he needs to do high school, why he's going to need to do college in order to do the mental health counseling that he work he wants to do. So it all ties together. And this is what really gets our kids moving. And that's what we got to do. So we pull it all together. After we've taken the time to create and explore and evaluate their dreams, we create their goals. And then we morph those for the college bound into college goals. So they know what they want to study. What's the best environment? You know, we've got everything available to us from create your own major, create your own classes, very hands-on oriented curriculum, um, very traditional liberal arts, heavy writing, Western Civ, really how to think creatively, how to critically examine texts and ideas and the great thoughts of all time and, and synthesize new ones and, and bounce new ideas off of those ideas and see what will actually work and what logically makes sense and all of those sorts of things. What is that environment? I, there, we can be in a class where there's eight people in our class all the time and there's lots and lots of discussion and Socratic dialogue. And we can be in classes where there's 400 people, nobody knows our name, we can just go do our thing and have a lot more privacy. We're also not as engaged. It's just different when different kids need different environments. And then of course the budget, the, the net cost things that we started talking about. And for the student too, for them to recognize, gee, I wanna go do this thing, that's gonna cost a lot. Do I need to get a job? Do I need to do some things to get scholarships? What do I need to be doing? You know, they they don't fully understand it because they just don't have the, the brain development and they don't have life experience, but they certainly understand that things cost money. So that gets them started. And then we, we help them to learn how to overcome hurdles because if we do all that other stuff and we don't teach them this piece, they're gonna have some problems. They have to be affirmed in their strengths and then learn how to overcome challenges, whether they are systematic and things from external to them or they are internal challenges um, because they're not feeling well or they have an accident or somebody dies or the car breaks down, whatever the million and things when things that come up in life, how do they overcome those hurdles? And is it a, a block in the road? I need to go around and find another way to do this thing. Or it's a block on the road, like the, the crazy roads we're seeing in Alaska right now after the huge earthquakes. You're not going to get from here to there on that path. That's not happening. And maybe you just need to go somewhere else and we need to change the goal. And so being able to evaluate all of that and, and to break open the tremendous opportunity that most of us call failure. When we make big mistakes, when we fail at something, there are huge lessons. And so building that rapport with the student as they're exploring their careers and getting some steam of, I'm good at these things, I like those things, I could see this coming in that direction and kind of becoming something in my life. It builds that rapport of say, okay, and this isn't working or that failed, I tried to do this thing and break it open. How can, what, what's that teaching us? What did it teach you? How could you approach it, approached it differently? What were other options, et cetera? And what other resources did you have? And just walking them through all of that so that they're ready. And ultimately our goal is a, to get our kids a great education that's affordable. And so by taking time during high school to do serious career exploration and goal setting, the students develop a focus and they're significantly more likely to graduate in four years. Given that the average and has, has been for years now in America, six years to get a bachelor's degree, this is saving 33% on college since they're done in two, we're cutting two years off of that six. So this whole piece, which is a little soft in the sense you can't numerically put it in a box and calculate it out, but this piece of working with the student to help them have a goal significantly contributes to saving on college by getting them done in four, closer to four than in six. As we know kids that are eight, 10 years in through college. It's, it's wow, that's quite a journey. Um, oops. So let's, let's shift a little bit. We're gonna talk about 
um, lowering costs some more because there are certainly more ways um, to save um, the cost of college and the cost of a degree. So let's take a peek. Um, one of the things that is fairly familiar to many people is that you can take certain tests while you're in high school and many colleges will give you credit for it. Not every college um, will give credit for everything. They all have different policies and you'll need to check them. But you have the advanced placement classes. You have the international baccalaureate programs. You have the CLEP exams and the DSST exams. CLEP is another program by the college board, which is the same people that does the, do the SAT and they do the AP tests. Um, and the CLEP are college equivalency exams. And they're very similar to AP, except they're based on college curriculum, not high school curriculum. So they're not common core aligned, if that makes a difference to you. Um, and they're also available at sites all over the country, all over the world, actually, and all the, every month. <laughs> it's not just in May when the AP tests are. Um, so you can prepare on your own and take a CLEP exam. These are great for homeschoolers, adult learners, um, and students who just want to get ahead and get some more um, credits. And you can research. I'm, you know, I've, I've done my homework. I know I kind of want to do this thing and look at this kind of school. You know, I'm, I'm noticing there's like five or six schools that keep coming up. So these are kind of my target schools. And I can look at their policies and say, do they take CLEP scores? The College Board website lists. There are many, 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 many colleges across the country and universities that accept CLEP exam scores. So then you'll know what the policy is. You can look up the same thing for the AP and the IB exams. Um, and then DSST was originally Dante, and um, I think their website is getcollegecredit.com. And this was set up for the military. And I and I always bring these up because they're they're a little bit different. Um, they're like business topics in there as well as the traditional English and math and history. And so there's some different test um, options that are available over in that program that are just not available in others. So depending on what your student is doing, they may be looking at going to community college or going into an area where some of those other tests would come into play and might be able to get credit. Um, they also have information on their website about the colleges and, and the universities that accept their scores. So. That is one option. Another one that is um, more popular in certain areas than others is dual enrollment. And what that means is high school students are taking college classes while they're high school students. And you have to, be, there's a lot of care that needs to be take, taken when you put this together, but um, high schools often have programs with the local community colleges in many states, and it, it's a government program, so it's going to be different no matter where you live. Um, but a lot of places, tuition uh, is waived for the high school students. Um, some places, the colleges have a lot of requirements about you have to be a certain age, or you're only allowed to take certain classes, or you're last in line. Other places, it's wide open. Um, and then you have, and that's just your local community college because you can also go to university and do online classes. And there's lots of different options here. Um, and those credits will be taken by the registrar at the university when they go to the four-year university and brought in as transfer credits. And everybody's, every single college and university has their own policies on it. Um, but they tend to accept real life college classes at a higher rate than they do the tests. But some schools, it doesn't matter. It's very different school to school. Um, but you are certainly documenting for admissions that you can do things at a college level. But a lot of times you're also going to get requirements waived or you don't have to take physics one anymore. You can start in physics two, um, which can be a great boon. And even if you're going, okay, yeah, but I could probably use physics once so you audit it or you just sit in and review and then take physics two second semester because you already had the credit while you were in high school and your, your tuition was covered or it's a reduced rate in any event, community college tuition is a lot cheaper than your university tuition. And depending on where you're at, the credit, the quality of the classes is as good. Um, particularly, I lived in California for 20 years and their community college classes are, are fantastic. 
However, you do need to be careful. For example, they quote remediate, which means those are teaching high school level classes. So physics, for example, having done engineering, uh, there's algebra based physics, which is what we typically think of as high school physics. There's also cal um, calculus based physics. That's your college level physics. So obviously if I'm going to university and I took the algebra based physics, even if I took it at the community college, I'm not gonna expect the university to give me credit. If I'm taking the calculus based physics at the community college while I'm in high school, then they may give me credit because that's what's gonna be expected in that curriculum in the sciences or in the engineering. So all of that. And then while in college, you can take courses during the summer. Um, and for some of my, my students, come from like Catholic um, backgrounds and they would like to take some high quality Catholic classes, but they are um, at a public university say. And so what they'll do is during the summer, they'll take some online while they're working and then transfer them in and get their humanities credits taken care of that way. Um, and online classes, obviously you're at home, but if you can finish the semester early, you're going to save a bunch of money. I'll get into that in a few minutes with some actual numbers. Okay, I guess it's the next slide. Sorry, I missed some of my notes. So graduating a semester early, you're saving between 5,000 and 13,000 on college costs. Obviously we have a big spectrum between the, oops, I'm sorry, what happened? Um, between public and private. And then we also have, we're working six months earlier. So, you're saving or you're financially ahead between twenty eight and thirty seven thousand dollars. If you're done a whole year early, you're saving more, right? fifty seven to seventy four thousand depending on your costs. okay? and And those are all average numbers. so your your mileage was going to vary a little bit, but that gives you an idea of you're probably not going to spend that much taking the classes during high school or in the summers when you're living at home. So, Getting done, because remember, you've got your your fees. In addition to your tuition, you've got your fees and your room and board and all of that stuff going on when they're away at school, when they're at home, a little different. So, okay. Let's get this back. And then something else I wanted to mention, a lot of people are not aware of these, but there are, are a consortium of states that have grouped together to give tuition reduction programs. And... There are a couple of private schools, mostly it's a public school thing. Um, and so I listed the groups of states here for you to take note of your state and what the name of its exchange or common market or program is called. And the way that these work, um, say for example, with my California kids, they might go to an Arizona school. And when they got accepted through the WUI program, then they were paying 150% of in-state tuition which would be between five and $10,000 a year off of out-of-state tuition. So typically that's how they all do it is 150% of in-state tuition. Um, there's fine print in everything. So for these, you need to be careful to go look up at their websites and see which colleges in the states are participating. And then inside the universities, which majors. Sometimes they will say it's every major except nursing, for example, because a lot of people want nursing, so they don't use them. They don't allow that for that. Um, or um, there might be shades. I had a student I worked with a few years ago who was a California high school student, went to Arizona State, and the way she had filled out her application was for straight through a business um, major. And I looked and it didn't qualify for WUI, but there was a very, very, very similar major and I said, um, these are two apples. I'm going to move you over here. And we saved her $60,000 on her degree. So it, you have to look at the details and make sure that you have everything lined up. And there's not extra paperwork for it. So that's very helpful. But it does pay to apply early because a lot of times they'll say, we'll take X number. And so if you apply later, you'll be in that late pool and you may not get to be able to do this. But that's something that just because of where you live and the agreements between these states, you may get to save quite a bit of money, which is super duper helpful. Okay. I was a little surprised as I was researching, actually a couple things here, nonprofit, I will say first, 
Um, all of the numbers I've been using are for nonprofit colleges. I think I'm hoping that you've all heard of for-profit colleges. Um, there are a number of them out there. Their graduation rates are abysmal and the student debt is very, very, very high. So I, I don't include them. I do not advocate that you use them. They're, they're generally not a good plan. They, they don't work very well for most of their students. But as I was doing my research for everything else, I was a little bit surprised to find that at this point, 25% of undergrads are now taking 100% of their classes online. So we've got 25% of our kiddos at home studying. And, and I'm seeing one of the ways that some of the colleges are dealing with having um, not enough seats in their classes is having pushing some of the kids to hybrid or online, um, which can be good, can be bad. But if, if you're home, obviously that tuition, I mean, the room and board part of things go down, the transportation part of things go down. Um, so that can be an issue that can save money. But I also want you to notice that there is a lower course completion rate than in-person classes. And with online classes, there's an enormous spectrum. You have everything from the classes Tuesday and Thursday from 2 to 3.30, and you need to log in at that time. So it's a lot like being in a classroom to other classes where um, they have no lectures at all. And you just log in whenever you log in and go see what the assignments are. And um, it's been quite interesting, um, the, the spectrum of modalities that are, are out there, um, even within the same college. So you have to have a student who's very motivated. I, I'm working with a young lady right now who got very ill and had to drop out of school. She took a medical uh, withdrawal and went home and got well. And, and then um, as she was reapplying, because she had a huge scholarship, so she wanted to prove herself that she was well and functional. Um, she did some classes and um, didn't have a car yet, so she did, was doing them online. And the spectrum of offerings that, that she's had to deal with, but she's super motivated. So she's on it every day and she changed her schedule. So she's got a big block every day uh, that she doesn't work, she doesn't let her work schedule her so that she can do school and she's super dedicated. But if you're just sort of, yeah, I'll take some classes while I'm, you know, working and trying to figure it out and I haven't really got a clue what I'm doing and you're not going to be as successful. So this can be a good um, avenue, but I wanted to just warn you so that as the directing parent, you certainly can help avoid some of those situations. There's no point in getting ourselves invested in these classes and putting money down and not getting the credits. And that, that obviously makes it more expensive and take longer. Okay. I mentioned before graduating in four. So in addition to the whole student side of, of knowing what you want to do and having an idea, there are also some other factors that come into um, getting out of school in time. Um, graduation rates, you'll be surprised. So you need to start to look these up when you're exploring a school. You need to know what their four-year and six-year graduation rates are. Um, if it's labeled as 150% graduation rate, they mean six-year. Um, some schools have less than 50% graduation rates. Some schools have less than 10% graduation rates. Um, off the top of my head, I'll give you an example. There's San Diego State University has a great international reputation as a good school and a good business school and da-da-da-da-da, pretty good school. It also has a reputation as a party school, but most schools kind of have that part. But anyway, their, their six-year graduation rate is 33%. 33, 33 means two-thirds of the kids are not done. Yeah. But their honors college graduation rate in four years is 77. So definitely can be done. But they, like a lot of other California schools, ran into problems with all the budget issues. And so a public college in California has a real hard time getting all of its kids through in four years because they just don't have the seats in the required classes. So the kids can't get them. Is that your student's fault? Absolutely not. So you want to watch what's going on with the graduation rates because that's one whole aspect of it. And then the other aspects is you don't have the peer support. You don't have the campus support because you've been to campuses that are kind of, we're more laid back here and, you know, we're about having the college experience or whatever, and they're not getting done. Well, that's expensive. Not getting done is expensive. So, and it's hard if you're that kid who's driven and really wants to go do your thing, it's hard to be the minority 
Um, and you don't have the peer support, you don't have the support on campus from professors and advisors and everything else. They're kind of like, oh yeah, you can take the minimum number of hours and you're still a full-time student and your grants and stuff will work, that's fine. But you won't graduate if you take the minimum number of required classes every semester. You won't get done in time. So <laughs> you need to have that, okay? Um, words like overcrowded or impacted means that there are not enough seats to get everybody they're allowing in through in four years. Don't have any illusions about it because there are not enough seats. So you're looking at a five-year ride, a six-year ride, a seven-year ride because they can't take it because it's only offered in the fall and it's a required sequence and then we can't take the next set of classes because this is a prerequisite. And so you have to go around. There's another lap. That's a whole nother year. Wow. And that's a re big reality in California, but it's also a reality in other places. Um, and then I also wanted to mention, because for some it's normal, there are engineering with co-op programs and there's architecture programs that come to mind very easily. Those are five-year programs. So for our schools that are heavy into having those majors and their graduation rates are higher than, you know, are lower, it takes them longer, that makes sense because they've got all these students in five-year programs. So take that into account when you're looking at the graduation rates at schools that are heavily into engineering and architecture. All right, so let's look on the flip side. We've looked at how to save some pennies. Let's look on how to find some more. So there are a lot of different aspects to this and we certainly can't cover them all today, but I wanted to at least mention them so you have some idea. So we've talked about academic strategies and um, in several aspects of that. There are tax, what we call tax scholarships. So there's different ways of doing your taxes to have savings that we call tax scholarships. Uh, tax capacity, that is different ways of distributing the taxes among people. Income shifting, cash flow, retirement, grandparents. There's lots of different things that can be explored in addition to what we're covering today. Um, I wanted to certainly mention something that especially if you have a tax preparer and you don't tell them you've got kids in college, they don't know. Um, you want to make sure you take advantage of these and you want to make sure you take advantage of the best combination of these so that overall the family is paying the least amount and you have the most money available for school. Obviously this is a cash flow thing, um, but it makes a difference. Um, and there are rules about using the qualified education expenses and what, what's defined for each one of these and not reusing them, et cetera. But for most of us, we've got enough expenses to use multiples of these. And you'll see some of them are per student and some are per return. So be aware of that. But definitely talk to your tax preparer and see what you can do to take advantage of these. Um, because you know a couple thousand bucks is definitely helpful. And then need-based aid, a lot of people think, oh, I won't qualify or, but, and so they don't want to fill the forms out. The forms have, well, the FAFSA, they've been working hard at making easier to use, which is good and bad, but it's easier to use. Um, and you're going to apply using what they call prior, prior tax returns. Don't let that throw you. So whatever the um, year is at the beginning of the school year for the student in college. So right now for seniors, that's going to be 2019 because it's a 1920 school year is their first as their freshman year. So 19 minus two is 17. So 2017's taxes are what we're going to use for the income piece. And we're going to use today, whatever date I'm filing for the asset information. Okay. If your school also requires the CSS profile, um, they use that for institutional aid where the FAFSA is used for federal aid and most will also use it for uh, state aid as well as for institutional. But then there are a small number of schools that also want the CSS profile. And you're going to use that same tax return information, your same asset information, but they're also going to ask you to project this year. So for, for our, our seniors, I have this year, which is 2018, they want me to project how much we're going to make by the end of the year and some of our expenses by the end of the year. They want to know my data from last year and they want me to project 2019. They're going to use three years worth of data and you get to file these forms every year. 
Um, but you definitely want to do it because there are a lot of schools that won't give you merit scholarships if you don't apply, apply for aid. So the short kind of rule of thumb is if you don't apply, you're telling them you could pay cash. If you don't want to pay cash for everything, then you should apply. Okay. Um, quickly going over some of these myths that people think um, that only low income or quote minorities receive aid. No, and especially with the rising cost of college, I think a lot of people are not thinking this as often, but they'll think, oh, we're middle class, we don't qualify, we're going to be squeezed. And you don't know until you know, and it varies by school. Um, only the best students get aid. No, not at all. Um, some of them are related to student performance. A lot of aid is not. The schools take care of it at all? No, they don't. Not at all. The family part needs to get done. Um, there's still a few people walking around thinking you can't get financial aid if you own a house. That was an issue back in the 80s. That is not an issue anymore. Um, it's an easy process. Um, yeah, not really. <laughs> not to be done well. Not to be done thoroughly. It's definitely not. Um, and you fill out one form and you're done. Mm, not usually. <laughs> not usually. So you need to spend some time on this. It's worth the effort, however. Um, then I do have a little bit of a caution that I want to share with you, and that is that say your EFC, your expected family contribution, after you file the forms, you get this number back and like, okay, I'm supposedly supposed to come up with 20 grand. Great. Well, the school costs 35. Okay, so that means that 15,000 I'm going to get aid for. But some schools don't meet 100% of demonstrated need. So some only meet half or two thirds. So, or some schools say they meet all of need, but all they give are parent plus loans. So you want to watch it. So it says at the bottom here, you know, you're going to pay your expected family contribution plus the unmet need to be your minimum out of pocket cost. So you may have loans on top of that, et cetera. So you do want to be careful as you're researching schools, you can find the percentage of need met. Um, there are very few 100% need met schools, and you can list them. You know, your Northwesterns, your Harvards, your Yales, et cetera, Cornells, et cetera. Um, then they tend to be very, very generous with their need-based aid and not give any merit aid. So there's, it's a complex process here, um, but I wanted to make sure you know about it. And then scholarships. Everyone's like, please, please give me scholarships. I want scholarships. Want to, want to make sure that you understand that 93% of the scholarship dollars come from the colleges. So when people think scholarships, they are typically thinking the Walmart or Nordstrom or Coca-Cola or those kinds of things. But 90% of the scholarship dollars are coming from the schools. So you get them for student merit, which could be academic. It could be athletic. It could be leadership. It could be other like debate. Um, and Scholarships are also given to draw students to the colleges. So liberal arts, local and master's colleges especially are going to use them. And then scholarships are also used to entice full pay students to enroll. So you've given them at least the FAFSA so they know you're a full pay, but they want your kid to come because it does feel good to say, my child went to XYZ University and got a scholarship. And they know that that feels good. So. They might have gotten into ABC College and XYZ University, and they're both really good schools for what they want to do. And they actually out of pocket cost the same, but this one gave you a scholarship and that one didn't. You're probably going to go with the scholarship one, is the psychological play. And it works, it's marketing. Um, but those are all reasons that kids get scholarships. So don't think, oh, my kid doesn't have a 4.9 and, you know, 8 million SAT score or something. It, there are other reasons to get scholarships. And I wanted to definitely address this drawing students to the college thing because it tends to be across the board. So what that means is that certain schools are using scholarships like coupons because they want you to come to their school. And the more um, regional they are, um, just certain categories of schools are ten more have a greater tendency to use this. So at research universities, for example, like about 36% of Tufts students are getting scholarships. 44% at Boston College, 
you know, it's 47 at Johns Hopkins. Notre Dame is 58, um, partially because they're Catholic kids. They have a parish scholarship, which means they send a bill to the local pastor and say, hey, cough up a little bit. So that's why that number is that high, because really their number is not that high. Um, but these are big research universities. Everybody, everybody in the world's heard of them. Everybody knows of Duke. Everybody knows Boston University. And so they don't have a need to entice people to apply and come to their schools. So they don't throw money there. Where excellent schools, and they call master's colleges because they offer bachelor's degrees and master's degrees, but they don't offer doctorates. You've got great schools like the University of Dallas or Creighton, Drake, uh, Regis, St. Catherine, where everybody or almost everybody is getting a scholarship just for going there. I've literally gone on college visits and the admissions office before we even left the office to walk on campus, they've said, oh yes, and if you come here, you'll get a $10,000 scholarship because we give one to everybody. So <laughs> it's a thing. And so that sticker price in the book saying it costs 45 grand, it really costs 35 grand. And then we'll look at aid because everybody's getting that 10,000. So you want to look for that because a lot of times we think, oh, that sticker price is too high. We can't possibly afford it. So when it's what I'm telling you about these things so that you can know where to dig, know how to find it. Um, some more examples, some liberal arts colleges that are phenomenally good schools, wonderful schools. Juniata, College of Idaho, everybody gets a scholarship. College of Worcester, McDaniel, Beloit, these are great schools. Okay. And because you go there, you're getting a scholarship. So if you get in, you're getting a scholarship. Um, that young lady I mentioned earlier who had to leave on a medical leave was at a school kind of like that. And so being there, she was going to get a scholarship. So it was a big deal for her to get readmitted because um, that bar is very high because she's got a full scholarship. Um, and at that school, that's for her, it was going to be a full scholarship and everybody gets something. So it wasn't just getting in, it was getting in with a scholarship. Um, but then we do have our schools that are terrific on the need-based side, but give no merit scholarships. And it makes sense, right? Harvard, Yale, MIT, Juilliard, Columbia, they how do, how could they even give merit scholarships the the level of proficiency their students have they couldn't possibly anyway but they don't certainly don't need to give a coupon hey come to harvard no it's harvard which doesn't mean it's the best school in the world but it's got a great reputation and for some people it's a great school for some people it's not okay and then I did want to take a minute to talk about that other 7%, the private scholarships, um, because the financial aid formula, you're required by law to tell the schools when you get these, and they reduce your eligibility for need-based aid dollar for dollar. That's how the formula works. Um, it's only about 1% of all aid. It's 7% of all scholarship money is the private. Um, they've got deadlines all over the place, and they require special essays and absolutely positively do not pay for scholarship search. You can go to my website, CelticCollegeConsultants.com, and in the FAQs, like a couple pages down, there's a question about scholarship sites, searching sites, and I have eight or 10 of them listed. Um, so I would suggest that you go there if you want to pursue this. I also wanna make a note that if you are looking for private scholarships, you don't have to wait until the student's a junior or senior in high school. There are things you can qualify for when you're in grade school and you get things, scholars, private scholarships you can apply for and get while you're already in college and some even for graduate school. So if that needs to be a piece that makes sense for you um, as far as your accumulating resources for college, be aware that you have this time spectrum and you want to take advantage of that. And then there are also tuition discounts. The... The average tuition discount at private scholarships is almost 50%. 19% of them discount 60% or more, and some dis some even discount more than 70%. And I expect as things shift in these next few years, the um, number of graduates is decreasing because we're having a population decrease, uh, decline in our high school graduates, um, that these numbers are going to shift even more. These discounts are going to be even higher. So really, really, really do not throw a school off the list because their sticker price seems too high. You need to see what's going on so you can get to what actually your net price is likely to be and then what else, what other strategies can you bring into play to lower it, et cetera. Um, 
So a lot of a lot of phenomenal things are going on in the private schools, um, but you've got to look. Well, this is a lot to do. Who will help us? Is your school counselor going to do all of this for you? And if you homeschool, you don't have a school counselor. So what in the world? Um, and all I just think of the high school counselors are going to do this, but their job actually is to get children through high school and their workload is insane and they're understaffed. So the approved ratio is 250 students per counselor, 482 to one students to counselor is the average. So they are grotesquely over, um, overtaxed. And they also have to deal with all the disciplinary issues and all the special needs students requirements, which these days with the explosion of depression and anxiety and all of that, all of those IEPs and 504s and any programs and assistance for all of those students also is the work of the high school counselors. Um, they aren't trained on the financial aid forms and don't know the rules and, and really will not talk to you about that whole side of it at all. Um, which is a problem because a student might be a great student, but if the financial part of it doesn't match, then we have a problem. So we've got to make sure both, both sides of the equation here go together. And of course, then once you graduate, you can't talk to them really anymore. That's beyond their, fully beyond their scope. So that's a problem because we have a need here, but who's going to help us? So some people say, well, maybe the financial aid officers at the school will help us. So they hire work-study students. So those are college kids who don't know anything about financial aid either, except their own experience, to answer their phones. That's very, very common. So a lot of times you call financial aid and you're talking to a college student who doesn't know a whole lot. Um, and having their job is to get you to come and pay as much as possible. They're nice to you, of course, and they want to help, but they have constraints and limits. And they're working for the institution and for the benefit of the institution. So it's kind of like having the IRS do your taxes. Yeah, you work for the government and you want my money. So you're not going to look for every deduction. The same kind of principle works with the financial aid officers. Um, so, and a lot of them do use leveraging. There have been a number of articles in um, Forbes and other business magazines about this, and they'll admit it. And that means that they're leveraging because they're favoring different categories of students, be that students of color or student athletes or students from Rhode Island or whatever, whatever their criteria is, whatever the university is defined as desirable category of student, they're going to leverage and those kids are going to get more because they're in that desirable category than other students because they're having an overall goal. Maybe the they've got a new trustee that's really looking for students in new majors that they're just getting opened or the president's got a, a shift and they're looking for more women students in this area or men students in that area or whatever. So all of those things come into play, which isn't necessarily for Joe Public's child. You know, do you fit in that bucket or not? They're not necessarily, they're not necessarily going to give you the clarity that you want. Um, so we can do it ourselves. Um, you can have your accountant do it, which is pretty funny. I get CPAs calling me every year going, oh, I don't know how to, don't know this form. Um, you know, but there's a lot of them. Give the college try. It looks simple. I'll try. Um, but they don't know the financial aid rules because that's not the IRS. It's the Department of Education, and they don't really speak the same languages. Um, investment people will ask their investment advisors. They're even further afield. They don't know all the IRS regulations or the Department of Education regulations. So that's not necessarily a good fit either. Makes this harder, doesn't it? Um, that's why people like me exist. <laughs> um, so I am a certified college planning specialist and this is all I do all day long is help kids get ready and help their parents figure out how to pay for it and put the whole thing together. So that all the puzzle pieces all line up and we have great college opportunities at affordable prices and the students are ready to take advantage of those opportunities. So. I, I help the kids get ready. I go through a whole career search goal setting process, which is very iterative. It goes around and around. The whole funding and financial aid evaluation and guidance. Um, I am not a licensed anything as far as selling you products. So if I suggest a financial product, it's because, and I'll explain it to you. you know, I see these advantages as far as your financial aid and college funding. It's not because I'm going to get a commission on it because I'm not. Um, 
major in college selection guidance, bringing in all the criteria. What are we looking for? We want same-sex dorms. We want study abroad in Africa or this or that. What are all the criteria, the most important things, less important things, and, and vet all that out and bring those to you as opposed to you trying to search the 4,000 colleges out there and figure that out. Um, and then I walk the students through the entire application process. Um, I help them figure out which extra extracurriculars to take and when to take the various tests and all that good stuff. Um, but then we walk through getting the applications done and submitted and through the whole essay writing process. A lot of times it's a blank piece of paper. and They have no idea what to put on there. I know what to put on there. So I help them create their essay because it has to be their voice, their message. But there are certainly ways to help them bring that forth and bring it forth in powerful, effective ways. I prepare financial aid applications for people. Um, and then I evaluate the offers. Is this a fair offer? Is there room for negotiation? If there's room for negotiation, why? And prepare you to do that. Um, then I also offer college preparation support services because some people are really into doing it themselves. And that way you're doing it yourself, but we're talking every month a little bit and I can give you some direction and I can point out, oh, that's a pitfall. Go around that. Oh, you want to take care of that. Notice that opportunity. That is an opportunity. Go do that thing. Etc. What are your priorities, etc. Giving you that guidance so that you're not on your own. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I've been doing this with families since 2004, studying engineering and theology. So that means I can do numbers and I can write. Um, and those are professional organizations that I belong to as well. So I would invite you to uh, create, uh, schedule a family consultation. We will meet for an hour. If you go to CelticCollegeConsultants.FullSlate.com and then click on my name, Catherine O'Brien, you'll be able to see my schedule and schedule an appointment um, with me. And it'll be either FaceTime or Skype. It'll be the parents and the student. I will send a survey beforehand. I will send an agenda beforehand. This is what we're going to talk about. And all of the different aspects with the student of where they are at so far. And then with the family, your concerns, your questions, and then my recommendations of how to move forward and what your options are, what your best options are. Um, and if it seems like a good match for us to work together, I will send you a proposal in writing with all of that for your review. And then we can decide how we'd like to move forward. Um, there's a fee for that of which I apply 40% to future services. Um, my kiddos have been well-prepared, focused. They have their own voice. It's not somebody else pushing a, something on them. It's them organically becoming who they are and their strengths and interests and all of that. They're articulate. They can express why they want to do what they want to do, why they want to go where they want to go. We write fit schools for them. Their applications are excellent. Their essays are memor memorable. We're done ahead of time and not all stressed out, freaked out at the end. The kids are getting big scholarships. The average over the last three graduating classes is $233,000 each aver on average in scholarships they were offered. Um, you know, the most I think I've had a couple of students now that are over 650 in what they were offered. So I've had a number of kids get full rides for various reasons. So it depends on what you're looking for, but we will tailor the outcome so that we achieve the success and the goals that you are looking for. So I wanna thank you very much for coming and spending this hour on a Saturday with me. Um, again, that website, down here, um, CelticCollegeConsultants.FullSlate.com. My email and my phone number is also available there. If you would like to contact me, um, I had such a privilege to work with people, students, and, and help the teens really figure out their voices and help parents know what to do next, what to do next, and not have to be trying to figure it out all on your own and making a bunch of mistakes like your neighbors are going to make and eight years later and their kids finally graduating and they're $8 million in debt and they haven't been able to work the last four years because they're still in school. Um, so thank you very much and have a wonderful day. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.